We have been focusing tonight on the path to an intelligence failure, the kind that might have ended with hundreds of American fatalities, in fact, not just American fatalities, others as well, had that alleged Christmas bomber succeeded. There is also the path that he took from child of privilege to allegedly soldier of al-Qaeda, and some of that story now coming to light through postings online. Randy Kay has that angle. One of his first online postings to the Islamic Forum appeared in February 2005. It reads, My name is Umar, but you can call me Farouk. The more than 300 postings paint the alleged Christmas Day bomber as a lonely teen, someone who felt isolated and lost between his Muslim faith and sinful temptations of the secular world. Farouk, 1986, writes, I have no friends, not because I do not socialize. I feel depressed and lonely. Dr. Gerald Post studies terror suspects and the online world. This was a man who was struggling uh, between the temptations of the West uh, and the strict uh, precepts of, uh, of the Koran uh, and finding himself failing. Authorities have yet to verify the postings were written by Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, but the information matches what we already know about his personal history. The username is Farouk 1986, a combination of the accused bomber's middle name and birth year. Kasim Rafiq knew Abdul Muttalib in college in London and describes him as humble. He never came across as anyone who was of concern. I mean, I mean, our conversations generally centered around, you know, football. But the post show he had more than football on his mind. Loneliness gave way to sexual desire, leading to, quote, minor sinful activities like not lowering the gaze, which he saw as his religious duty. He tried fasting to avoid what he called evil thoughts. The poster also wrote about life at an elite boarding school in Togo, Africa. That's where this young man first met Abdul Muttalib. He remembers him as devoutly religious. He was a peaceful person, like, I, I, you know, was a friendly person, sociable. The happiest posts are from June 2005, when Farouk 1986 writes from Yemen, where he was learning Arabic. The Yemenis are so friendly and welcoming. None of the postings reveal extremist views or any hint of radicalization. One posting, March 2005, includes his strongest words related to the Iraq war and former President George Bush. It reads, why not forgive Bush for invading Muslim lands and killing my Muslim brothers and sisters, all the people who oppress the Muslims and all people who do me wrong, for surely Allah's torment is enough for them. But are those the writings of a man who four years later would sew enough explosives into his underwear to bring down a U.S. airliner? It's something very seductive about the path of jihad when you're coming from that psychological state of meaninglessness. Loneliness, confusion, and a desire to belong may have preyed on Umar Abdul Muttalib. Randy Kay, CNN, New York. Digging deeper now, Peter Bergen is back with us, along with Kirk Lippold, former commander of the USS Cole, and an outspoken opponent of releasing Guantanamo Bay inmates begun during the Bush administration, some of whom reportedly worked with the alleged bomber in Yemen. Gentlemen, good to have both of you with us. Peter, as, as you look at the picture that has been painted by these postings online, what we just learned from Randy here, a, a young man grappling with his Muslim identity in a secular world, a man who felt alone, was Abdul Muttalib just a prime candidate for al-Qaeda recruitment? There is no prime candidate for al-Qaeda recruitment because there are all sorts of people who are being recruited. I mean, uh, Mohammed Atta, the operational uh, commander of 9-11, you know, he was somebody who spoke several languages, a misogynist, uh, PhD in urban preservation, ironically. Uh, you know, Zia Jara, one of the pilots uh, uh, on 9-11, uh, was somebody who drank and socialized and was a fun guy. So there's no, you know, the fact that this guy was lonely, to me, is neither here nor there. That doesn't make him a, a prime target. Uh, he chose this path uh, uh, for reasons that we still don't really quite know. Uh, and hopefully we'll be learning more of that as, as we learn more and this and this proceeds because of course he is still alive. Commander Lippold, I want to read to you part of a letter which was written today to the president by Senators Lindsey Graham, uh, John McCain and Joe Lieberman. It says, quote, we write to express our deep concern about reports that the administration is planning to transfer six Yemeni nationals currently being held in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, to the
to the custody of the government of Yemen. We request an immediate halt to the transfer of all detainees to Yemen until the American people and the Congress can be assured of the security situation in that country. There are just under 200 prisoners at Guantanamo at this point, 91 of them from Yemen. Is that a reasonable request to keep these particular prisoners at Gitmo for the time being? I think it's very reasonable and I think it's a very good precautionary move. At this point, not knowing what the situation is in Yemen, to repatriate six detainees that an interagency review board has determined can now be released with uh, probably some pressure from the White House, clearly it's time to take a pause and say, keep them where they are, let's see how the situation continues to develop, and then make a long-range determination whether or not it's in our national interest to continue to release these detainees from Yemen. Uh, clearly in, in the past they haven't proven their ability to govern their country, so it really doesn't make sense to be sending all these Yemeni detainees back. Peter, we should point out that the two detainees who were released in November of 2007 were actually Saudi nationals, two, two men who have been linked to Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, the group which has taken uh, claimed responsibility for this uh, alleged failed attack on Christmas Day, again, from Saudi Arabia, where they were sent to rehabilitation, not from Yemen. Is it a Yemen-specific problem? Well, Commander Lippold knows this better than I, but I mean, you know, the USS Cole attack, uh, there were not, not one prison escaped by people involved in the Cole attack, there were two. So it's not just that the Yemeni government uh, doesn't have much of a grip on its country, it doesn't have much of a grip on its own prison system. And I, I uh, you know, Commander Lippold and I have disagreed in the past uh, on this show about uh, the recidivism rate of the detainees, uh, but whether you think it's four, whether some people think it's 14 percent, as the Pentagon says, and I think it's nearer 4 percent, that's immaterial right now. Clearly, the situation in Yemen is such that it would be fairly irresponsible, I think, just to willy-nilly return people to a place where uh, the, you know we, what, what, we, what we just seen in the last in the last few days. So. Um, now, the, 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 I don't know enough about the cases of these guys we're talking about, the six that are being released. Apparently, their habeas corpus hearings were going to come up. They're probably low-hanging fruit. They may mm -hmm. not be the most... Uh, there are about 100 Yemeni de detainees. And my, my guess is that these guys are probably uh, some of the, the ones that there are less concerns about. But nonetheless, I think it's reasonable to say, uh, let's, uh, let's have a pause here and let's see what's going on in Yemen before we do anything, uh, you know, precipitate. And when it comes specifically to the country of Yemen, you alluded a little bit to this, Commander Lippold, and there's been so much talk about the government and how, uh, frankly, unstable it can be, definitely depending on which way the wind is blowing at times. Uh, we mentioned earlier the foreign minister telling the BBC, you know, we need Western nations to do more. They have a responsibility in this fight. The U.S., though, clearly has stepped up, pledging $67 million in 2009. That's up from $4.6 million in 2006. But sometimes the remarks from the government seem to sort of be wavering. Commander Lippold, how willing of a partner do you think the government of Yemen is when it comes to the fight on terror, when it comes to attacking and, and frankly eradicating al-Qaeda in, in their own country? Well, I think you can look at the track record. I mean, despite U.S. attempts to try and help Yemen out, they have not proven themselves to be a reliable or trustworthy partner. Even today, when you look at it, Yemen is only responding because suddenly the heat's being applied to them and the president is realizing that it could be his skin or his neck on the line by these terrorists that are trying to destabilize various parts of the country. I think we have to realize that we can push as much money and training as we need to to try and help the Yemenis government combat al-Qaeda on the peninsula. But the reality is, unless President Saleh allows these forces to develop, get trained and be equipped, to go into the country to be able to take on some of the tribal regions that are giving free reign to al-Qaeda, that we're not going to be able to be effective. And what's going to happen is we will end up in the same awkward position we were in 2002, where we're going to be conducting unilateral operations in order to safeguard our national interests. And we'll do it with or without the Yemenis government cooperation. But it'd be much better if we could do it with them. Commander Kirk Lippold, Peter Bergen, appreciate both of you being with us tonight.